please welcome Tim Warwick. <laughs> Man, it's great to be here. Forgive me, I've got uh, I've got more notes than the David Wright arrangement. <laughs> Hopefully, these are in the right place. <laughs> Love you, David. Thanks for coming. Oh wait, he's not here. When when Marty and Skip called me about doing this a couple weeks ago, I. Uh, Stared at the email. Well, actually, they emailed me, and I stared at it for probably 20 minutes and said, "How would I possibly do this? I don't speak in public, and my quartet knows that because I've said I'll never talk on stage. I would rather sing Go the Distance, Cruella de Vil, Good Vibrations, and any other hard song back to back than do a speech. <laughs> and today, I'm going to get to do both. <laughs> so, yeah, off to the races we go. It." Um, you know, the gold medal standard of keynotes is by my mentor, Jim Henry. Uh, gold medal moments is what it's called. And today we are getting, you're going to get silver medal moments from, <laughs> from me. This story of mine starts about a year ago. I was comfortably seated and upgraded to Delta Comfort Plus <laughs> on my way to the Midwinter Convention, my favorite convention in San Antonio. And I was super excited about this convention because it's very rare for me to go to a convention where I don't have to be on stage and sing. Uh, even though I love to be on stage and sing, it's so nice to just kick back and be a barbershop or go out and sing tags and have a good time and, and do that. But this time I, I didn't have, I was ready to go. And I was most excited about seeing the quartet that turned this from a hobby into a passion for me. And that would be the 25th anniversary champs last year, Keepsake. And I was beyond excited to see Keepsake, trust me, I was like a kid. And I texted lead Joe Conley from the plane to tell him I was comfortably seated on the plane and, and told him I could not wait to see my, the quartet, one of my all time favorite quartets. And took off uh, for my layover in Dallas. When I landed in Dallas, my phone was blowing up. And I mean, what happened? And all of the texts were from my childhood heroes, Joe Conley and Tony DeRosa. And um, as I read the texts from Joe, it became apparent that he was not going to make it to this convention. He was, uh, it was a weather issue and he was not gonna make this. And I was just so devastated. And then that turned into an insurmountable amount of nerves <laughs> when I read the text from Tony DeRosa that asked me if I would fill in for Joe Connolly and keep saying it. <laughs> Somebody said, wow, that's a dream come true. I said, no, that's a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, come on. I got to fill in for the most recognizable lead voice in the history of Barbershop? That's not easy, right? Interestingly enough, I had just been fighting laryngitis uh, just a couple weeks before that, and so I just didn't even know if I could even sing. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't think I can do this. So of course I agreed. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to miss out on this. But it really took me back to a time when I was a kid and, and I was an insecure you know, kid, and my predominant emotion was self-doubt. I started singing Barbershop about 25 years ago in 1993. Yes, I am that old. <laughs> and I was living in Levittown, Pennsylvania. I was going from elementary school into middle school. And my mom saw a newspaper article that said there was a barbershop group at my middle school. And she said, Tim, you'd be great at this. Like, this is perfect for you. You love to harmonize. It's barbershop music. And I said, what's barbershop music? And she said, well, they sing songs like Sweet Adeline, Sweet Adeline. And I was like, cool. <laughs> I think I'm good. <laughs> I think I'll hold off on this. <laughs> and, um, but I really didn't have much desire to join, but it was the select choir at school. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try to make the, the select choir. And so I auditioned, and my, my teacher 
Ellen Fit, uh, actually put me in the group. And she put me at tenor. And no matter how much I've tried, I still sing tenor. And she also had a larger group called Fit's Finest that met on Monday nights. It was a group of 55 young people between the ages of 11 and 18. And I think that's impressive. What was really cool, though, was this was just such a cool environment to be in, to sing with people my own age and, and make friends and sing and do all that stuff. And Mrs. Spit, my teacher, she believed in me, and I knew it. And to me, that meant more than anything. Um, she put me in a quartet right off the bat, and we were going to go compete at the Mid-Atlantic District Youth Outreach Division Contest. And... So we worked super hard for that. It was just like, this is, this is it. This is what I'm here for on, in life. I'm going to compete in this quartet. And so we went into that contest, and we worked so hard. And we walked out there. And I can still see the audience and the judges. And I was pretty nervous about it all, but we went out there, and we absolutely went for it. And in my very first contest, I placed dead last. <laughs> So a year later, she put me in another quartet, three different people, and we called ourselves the next quartet of the evening. <laughs> Man, I wish Vocal Spectrum had been called that. that would have been so nice. And um, there were more quartets in the contest this time, so I was like, wow, this is really growing. It's so cool to see more young people at these conventions. Went out there, had a great hit, felt awesome. And we got last place. <laughs> and there were more quartets that time. And I remember driving home and my mom said to me, you know, Tim, I really wish you could be in a quartet with you know, three people that are better than that. Like, you're so talented. And she actually uh, called me this morning and said the same exact thing, just 20 years ago. <laughs> Still saying it. It's true. Hi, Mom. That's true. I got last in county choir. I auditioned for that. I went in. My voice was changing. I went to sing. My voice cracked all over the place. I stopped singing and I walked out. Got last place in that. I never got a solo in high school, and I never felt like I really had a place, especially when it comes to music. It just was like, well, you're all right. But Barbershop changed that for me. Uh, it gave me confidence as a singer. Fitz Finest went all over the Mid-Atlantic District. We went to Harmony College East, um, and I even got a chance to go down with my quartet, uh, another quartet, and coach with Freddie King from the Oriole Four. And Freddie was amazing. Freddie was just the best. He coached us for free. And he would sit in his basement on his couch. And he would sit there and he would take notes as you sang. And then he would rip you to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> he would. And what was interesting, though, is when I left there, I would always walk out feeling better. Somehow. I walked out feeling like I had learned something, that I was so much better, and that, even more importantly, Freddie believed in me. He had that amazing gift to, to inspire. And he was somebody that just meant so much to me back then and still today. In late 1995, I saw the Gas House Gang for the first time. And the Gas House Gang was my favorite quartet. My, back in school, we would put the music on, on the speakers and we would like broadcast their CDs so we would put on, like, Sit Down, You're Rockin' the Boat, and 16 Tons, and we would sing as loud as physically possible <laughs> with the Gas House Gang. I'd sing Rick's part on the high. That was me. I just loved that. <laughs> they were larger than life to, to us. They were, they were just amazing and huge. Imagine my disappointment when I met them. And they were <laughs> you don't even know what to say. We were the ultimate nerds, though, when the Gas House Gang walked out on stage. We were in the front row, and we actually got on our knees and bowed to the Gas House Gang when they walked out. <laughs> 
And my mom bought me my very first barbershop tape, which was the Gas House Gang's A Little Night Music. So I remember trying to post Bright Was the Night along with Kip and uh, cried along with I Still Can't Say Goodbye and I Still Can't Make It Through That Either. <laughs> and um, I, you know, the Gas House Gang was just so inspiring and they actually donated tons of tapes to our group. So everybody ended up getting their tapes. And so I imagine, Rick, do you still have some of those that you're giving away? All right, go see Rick if you want a Gas House Gang tape. If you still have a tape player. <laughs> but that was one of the things that hooked me on Barbershop. I listened to it all the time. And I uh, ended up going to the International Convention in 1997 in Indianapolis. And that was my first convention, and I have not missed one since. In February of 1998, a friend of mine, um, actually, just rewinding a little bit, a couple weeks, probably the end of January, uh, Fitz Finest disbanded. Ellen retired, and the group was no more. And I thought to myself, well, that's it. I'm not going to sing Barbershop anymore. I always thought Barbershop was something that I would just do in high school or middle school, and that would be it. And I wouldn't go on and sing Barbershop in the future. I don't even know how to join this society. And uh, my friend Dan Dyceroth, who's been just a huge, great, great friend to me over the years, he called me and he said, hey, Tim, would you want to come up to, I have this new chapter that I'm singing in called The Brothers in Harmony. Would you be willing to come up to Easton, Pennsylvania with us and check it out? And I said, sure, why not? And so February 25th, 1998 was a day that absolutely changed my life. I went up to that meeting and it was unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire life. There was such passion. And Jack Pinto from Old School was their director. And Jack directed with such intensity <laughs> and so much energy. And the guys in the chorus were just so welcoming. I remember we sang tags all night long, at least it felt that way. We went over to the Elks Lodge and sang tags and, and they thought I was good. Like they kept saying, man, you're great. And I kept going for every high note that I could and I think I got most of them. Um, but it was really cool, they believed in me and I felt like I had a place, I was encouraged by this. It was such a cool thing. One thing that is very important to this story though is that on the way up, Dan played me the Keepsake album, The Entertainer. How many of you have that? That's like amazing. To me, I loved Tags more than anything back then. And if you love Tags, that's your album right there. I remember hearing the Tags of the Eyes Medley and Somewhere and How Deep Is the Ocean. I remember where I was along the drive when I heard those Tags. <laughs> life changing and I said to myself gosh I want to do this for the rest of my life I want to be this good I want to sing like that and it really was a huge moment for me so the next day <clears throat> I started my multi-tracking hobby started recording myself I would take a tape recorder and I would record the lead part and then I would have another tape recorder with this tape recorder I'd play the lead part back I would sing bass along with it, so then that tape would record that, and then I'd go back and I would <laughs> record the baritone part and go back over to that, and I came up with my own little multi-track recording. <laughs> Somehow, someday, someday. during that time, funny enough, from learning tracks. I would listen to the learning track, I could learn by ear, and then I would look at the music and look at the interval, and I would figure that out. No phones, please. Um, <laughs> I get very easily distracted. Um, so that's how I learned how to sight read. And, um, but during that time, I was just getting really, I, I was so excited, but I didn't know where to go with it. I just didn't know what to do. I went to my first district convention in 1998, and um, I was standing there talking to one of my good friends and one of my biggest mentors, Mark Powell. 
And Mark and I were standing there, and I was too shy to ask anybody to come up and sing with me. I just couldn't do it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to go up to this guy and say, hey, sing a tag. And I couldn't do it. And I said to Mark, Mark, I just want people to like think I'm good and know who I am and want to sing with me. And Mark looked at me and goes, Tim, I don't think you're going to have any problem with that. <laughs> he still tells that story every time I see him. <laughs> I went on uh, pretty quickly after that to get a new quartet. And I sang in numerous quartets back home in the Mid-Atlantic District. I placed as high as second in the Mid-Atlantic District contest with a quartet called Good Times. And I joined a very elite club of Mid-Atlantic District second place finishers. <laughs> That's me and Sean Devine right there. <laughs> Sean and I sang together in good times back then, and um, it was just so much fun and uh, such a cool opportunity to sing with someone like Sean and get to learn from him and then still be such good friends all these years later. It's, it's, it's great. Um, how many of you in school felt like you just were like super confident? Like when you were growing up, were you confident? You know, no, no, most aren't, most aren't. But every once in a while you got that guy who puts on the show and you think, man, <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm doing, but I don't think so. I think, I think almost every kid out there struggles with self-worth and, and confidence. I knew I could sing music really well, but I wasn't sure how successful I could be at it. My family, my teachers, especially my mom, were always just so encouraging of me, but something was missing. I was filled with self-doubt and Barbershop gave me confidence. Singing with other people has more power than any of us realize. Singing with people not only helps forge social bonds, but it also does so very quickly. It's an instant icebreaker, a bonding agent. How many of us have stood around and sung tags with people we've never met before, and now we're lifelong friends with them? I know I have, many people. Music brings us together, and even at a young age, I realize that it's the music that brings us together, but it's the friendships that we make that keep us there. I remember singing a tag with Joe Connolly, and initially I was pretty good, and then I started to shake. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm singing with Joe Connolly. Because I think singing is a very vulnerable thing. It's scary to sing in front of, in front of other people. How many of you remember that, your first tag with somebody that, was, that you thought was good, or just your first tag in general? How scared were you to do it? How unsure of yourself? It's a very vulnerable thing. A lot of people believe that vulnerability is weakness, and I thought that for a long time too. But I actually believe that vulnerability is the cornerstone of confidence. When you allow yourself to be open and take a risk, you realize that you're just like everyone else. And that gives you the confidence to be yourself. Vulnerability is actually your greatest strength. And Barbershop gives us that strength through the vulnerability of singing. I think that's why we make such great connections with each other. It's because it is vulnerable to just open up and sing a tag. Like walking on stage. How about those nerves before you walk on stage? Anybody feel that? As I certainly do. I feel it very much so, like right now and later today. And, um, it's a vulnerable experience, but how good do you feel when you come off stage? Most of the time. <laughs> We've all been there, right? Um, you can't get to courage without walking through vulnerability. Let me say that again. You can't get to courage without walking through vulnerability. You have to go there in order to be courageous, in order to go for your goals, in order to do it. And I learned that, and I learned it, once again, through Barbershop Harmony. Continuing my story, in 2002, I had an amazing opportunity. I met the Gas House Gang, and I got to sing with them. I got to sing Goodbye World Goodbye with Mr. Knight over there, and Dr. Jim Henry and Rob. And I have to say, I think I crushed it. <laughs> it's pretty good. And Jim was, and they were also encouraging, but Jim especially came over to me and he said, I'd like to offer you a scholarship to come to my school. I would love for you to come to St. Louis. And I said to myself, I can't do that. That's my, I, I can't leave home. That's my home. I can't go. I'm too afraid. And then that summer, I went to Harmon University 
If you haven't gone to Harmon University, do yourself a favor and go. It's the best week of the year. I sang in the Next Generation Chorus under the direction of Kirk Young. And Kirk had, uh, one of the songs was Laura Bell Lee. And there was a little interlude in the middle that uh, he wanted to use a quart uh, quartet for. So Kirk actually had auditions for it, and we all sort of sang it, and I got the tenor part in that little thing. And he introduced me to the three people that I had never met before in my life that I was going to sing with. And those people were Corey Hunt, Eric Dalby, and Johnny Maroney. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk, you just put together three quarters of vocal spectrum. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, we, we sang all week long. We didn't just sing Laura Bali. We sang every tag and known to mankind, and I posted more high notes that week than I have collectively in my entire life. And uh, it was just so much fun. And that, the friendships that I made there, we talk about that bonding agent, the friendships that I made with Johnny and Eric, along with the offer from Jim Henry, and the, scale, and the salesmanship of Johnny Maroney. Johnny, are you here? Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm glad my quartet supports me. I'm glad my quartet loves me so much. Eric's here, though. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Um, so it was actually Eric that convinced me to go. Don't even think about Johnny. Talk about Johnny. If he walks in, we boo him, okay? I'm going to keep my eye out. All right. I joined the Ambassadors of Harmony, and actually within a month, I ended up in Vocal Spectrum. And Jim Henry was our teacher at our school, and he was our coach. We worked hard, and we worked every single day. We sing together every day. And Jim would coach us, and we'd go back, and he'd give us more, and then we'd work on that, and then we'd go back, and then it just was a really cool time for us to sing in the same choir and get coached by Jim. I learned that if you want to be successful in anything, you've got to put the work in. I didn't really have a work ethic before I sang Barbershop. I didn't really try hard in school. I didn't do well in school for a while until I started singing Barbershop. I just didn't have the drive or the, or the work ethic, but Barbershop gave that to me. I learned if you want to be successful at anything, you've got to put the work in, and you've got to do it over and over again. Zig Ziglar said, repetition is the mother of learning. Once you know how to do that, and once you put that all together, it's easy. I mean, the process is... Is easy. Doing it is hard, but it's possible. And when Vocal Spectrum was ramping up for contest, all we did was repeat, 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 repeat. We just would do the set over and over again, little tweaks here, and then we'd keep going. I learned through Jim and, and through these experiences that it's one thing to have talent, but it's another thing to take that talent and hone it to, to excellence. And it's even more to take that excellence and then send it out to the world unashamedly to change people's lives and affect them. And I think that is the power that we've had as an organization on more people than you could possibly imagine. Jim taught me that. And now that I had a place in barbershop, a friend of mine called me up and said, hey Tim, would you be willing to do learning tracks for my chorus? And I thought to myself, and I literally said to him, well, they're going to be bad, but I'll do it. <laughs> so I did it. So I started recording, and suddenly my little multi-tracking hobby turned into uh, something that I was doing a little more professionally. It was never enough to make enough money to do it full time, but it was enough to put gas in a college student's car and eat sometimes and stuff like that. I can still eat. It's good. Um, still know how to eat. Um, but I never dreamed I'd be able to do it on a full-time basis. When I first met Joe Conley, I always thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to be a full-time barbershopper? To just always do barbershop, 24-7. What could go wrong with that? And let me just speak about Tim Tracks and my learning tracks for a second. Because my goal is, was never, and still is, has never been, to create a business. Um, I've always just been a barbershopper first. And... Uh, my goals when I created Tim Tracks uh, was to be recognized as good, to give something, to give people something they can listen to and learn from and enjoy, and to have significance and to have a significant impact. 
and I've worked so hard for 15 years. It's been my passion, and I feel like it's been my ultimate contribution. And it's been my honor to record these tracks for you guys for 15 years now, over 1,500 tracks, and I promise I'm not even halfway done. I mean with the tracks, not the speech. On my life's greatest moments, winning international is not at the top. I am so proud of it. But the hard work that, uh, but the hard work that went into it was more important. And then even more, traveling the world and meeting people, meeting friends, has been just an amazing gift to me. The perspective that travel has given me I've been to Germany and Sweden, England, Russia. We've been to Juarez, Mexico. I've been to New Zealand, Australia, China, and Japan. And even Hawaii, my favorite place on the globe. <laughs> <laughs> I love Hawaii. But, but I've made amazing friends in all of these places. And I can go to any of those countries, probably not Juarez, but I can go anywhere else. And I've got friends, I can stay with them, and. Um, it's just amazing what, what the power of barbershop music has done for my life. It's changed my perspective on life, diversity, and understanding what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. Our new strategic vision is all about love and acceptance. I think the time is now for us to talk less about change and be the change that we know we can be. We have to live the change. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I think that's what this comes down to. Although competition was no longer my goal, I put a lot of pressure on myself as a uh, international champion. I felt that people thought I was better than I was. And I would strive to keep up the image that people had created of me. And that became a very quick mental and vocal crash course. Traveling the world with three of my best friends has been the greatest experience of my life. And we've been doing it for 15 years. <laughs> Can't believe it. <laughs> Can somebody applaud? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I did not expect that. <laughs> but it kind of leads into something that I hope I can get through because it is important to me. You know, during that time, I just was like, we started adding songs that were harder. And they, and they were louder and higher and longer posts and higher posts. And let's just keep going for it. And um, over time, it got more difficult. And I started to complain about my voice. And, my guy, and the guys were like, oh, you sound great. You're fine. I've had friends. Oh, man, you sound amazing. You always say you don't sound good, but, or you don't feel good, but you, you sound great. But I knew something wasn't right. <clears throat> I knew that something wasn't right. And I knew I had acid reflux. Uh, I was diagnosed with that a while ago. And... I tried my own version of a reflux diet that still had ice cream in it, of course. <laughs> and uh, I took the medicine, though. The medicine was the trick, right? And I even attempted a surgery to help with my reflux. Uh, it didn't improve. It, it, in fact, it kept getting worse. And the thing that was interesting was my voice had become my identity. It was the one thing that I could do. I could sing. And I latched onto that. And that was being taken away from me. And ENTs couldn't figure it out. They didn't know what was going on. And nothing seemed to work. And, but I knew this. I was in a lot of pain with every note I sang and every word I spoke. I began to isolate myself. I sang less and less, gained some weight. I pushed through my singing, and that came at a price. 
I need multiple days of rest before the show and multiple days of rest after the show. And that one thing that brought me joy was now the one thing that I despised. Just imagine that. Like, how much do we love singing? Why are we here? We love singing, right? Imagine the joy of singing turning into nothing but pain and struggle. That vulnerability that I talked about earlier, well, I was walking right through it, front and center. And that three-year battle had taken away my joy. And a lot of it was the fact that I just couldn't sing with people. I mean, I would go to conventions and I would try to rush through the lobby because I just, just didn't have much voice and it hurt. So I was like, well, I gotta get to the stage to sing with my quartet and I gotta, I gotta preserve that. And um, thankfully, through this struggle, God taught me that my worth isn't just in my voice. It's, it's just me and that's fine. I could still sing enough and my quartet rallied around me. Friends supported me. And when someone would walk up to me and say, hey, can you sing the Go the Distance tag? I got more and more comfortable saying, hey, sorry, I'm just not feeling very good, so I, I can't do it. And they'd all understand, well, except for one person. And Marty, I promise, will sing that tag. <laughs> We're going to do it this weekend. We're doing it. If I can get myself together, we're going to do that tag. <clears throat> and during that time, a profound quote impacted me on my journey. And that's from Theodore Roosevelt. Let me read it for you. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who actually does strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And uh, Teddy's distant relative, Franklin Roosevelt, said, the one thing we have to fear is fear itself, right? So don't be afraid. And that's what I learned. Don't be afraid. Go out there. Dare greatly. Work towards your goals. Fight for them. So this past March, a world-renowned ENT diagnosed me with a weakened cricothyroid muscle. It's essentially the muscle that stretches the vocal folds into the high range. Most likely a virus had attacked the vocal folds, or attacked the cricothyroid and the nerve in my larynx, and it never recovered. This was permanent. I have a partially paralyzed right vocal fold. Reality began to set in that this career, this passion, was over. It's not easy to sit there and have an ENT look you in the eyes and go, you're a candidate for numerous vocal surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> but he offered some voice therapy, and I went through that. I decided I'm going to do it, and I'm going to work so hard at it. And he said, you've got reflux. I said, but I had the anti-reflux surgery. I don't have reflux. I can eat pizza, and I'm good. <laughs> and um, that was just wishful thinking for me. Um, so in May of 2017, I began my voice therapy. I worked with two of the greatest voice therapists in the world in Philadelphia. And my singing therapist recommended Dr. Aviv's The Acid Watcher Diet. I didn't start the diet right away because I still was very stubborn and didn't want to admit that that was the problem. But after some soul searching this summer, I decided to start it. I decided to put the work in. As I described how hard I was working to my good friend, Sean, divine. He said, no one has any idea how determined you are. You're going to do this. And he's right. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> I'm going to try to keep it together, guys. I'm sorry. This is a difficult thing. Um, and I still carry this straw around with me to sort of reset the pressure in my, in my voice and mm, gets my voice working nice and cool, nice and easy. Gets my, gets my voice functioning at a higher, better level. I retrain my voice and my body to sing well, even with the injury, with better technique. And this new lower acid eating lifestyle that this book says, which by the way, if you struggle with that or you have reflux, read the book. I promise it works and it's livable. This lifestyle has allowed for true healing from the damage that acid reflux had on my voice. I've lost almost 50 pounds since this summer. <laughs> And uh, today I'm proud to tell you, I feel great. My voice feels great. It feels better than it has maybe ever. It's not perfect, and the, but the pain is gone. It doesn't hurt to talk. This has not been painful. I'm recording more tracks. I'm singing more tags with everybody that I possibly can find to sing with me. Which is not hard. <laughs> and I didn't realize how powerful that was until I had to seclude myself from it. I had no idea how powerful singing with people was until I had to pull myself away and, say, and, and not do it. Few things in this world, in my opinion, are better than singing. Maybe like ice cream and like Ruth Chris steaks and stuff like that. Just kidding. I can't have that stuff anymore anyway. So. <laughs> but I enjoy singing more than I ever have. Please don't take that for granted, guys. This day and age, we don't even have to leave the house. We can talk to anybody through Facebook, through Twitter, through Instagram. We just text back and forth. We can watch any movie we want, any TV show we want, at any time of day. It's just so easy to just stay in. And I feel like at this point, we're, we're at a, a point in our society as a whole where it's possible to have constant social interaction I believe we have started to mistake communication for communion. Without, yeah. Without communion, we're missing the true spirit of friendship, connection, and the spirit of our humanity. If you're watching this on Facebook or wherever, and you haven't gone out to sing for a while, my gosh, go out and do it. Make some connections. Hang out with people. Be around people. Have communion. And I promise you, you will not regret it. As Jim Henry said in his famous gold medal moment speech, don't squander your notes. <laughs> Sing every one of them with joy, passion. Because I believe God gave us this transcendent gift of music. And how blessed are we to have found it. Take care of your voices. Sing with passion. Sing with anyone and everyone. And most importantly, sing with technique approved by Steve Scott. <laughs> So one year ago, as I prepared to walk on stage with Keepsake, I told fear to go away. Laryngitis and all. I said, you know what? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to have a good time with the quartet that changed this hobby for me. And I did. And it was one of the highlights of my life. I had a blast. I was very nervous. <laughs> but it was just so much fun. And as I, finish, as I finish up here, I have one last thing to say. As I've gotten older... I've noticed a shift in my role when it comes to the younger generation of barbershoppers. And the main thing is, I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, I've realized that I'm becoming more of a mentor now. It's kind of the circle of life, right? I see those who so selflessly mentored me. Jim Henry, David Wright, Joe Conley, Gene Cocroft, Freddie King. And that list goes on and on. Gene and Freddie are no longer with us. And so many of all of our mentors have passed on. 
When Jean passed away in 2015, I asked myself, who replaces Jean Cocroft? That's an irreplaceable person. The impact that Jean had on Barbershop, the legacy as a singer, a youth, organi youth, harmonizer, a youth in harmony organizer, and a genuine person who listened not to respond, but to understand. That's why we all felt such a close connection with Jean. And I asked myself, who's going to fill those shoes? And the answer became very clear to me. It's me. And it's you. That's our responsibility. It's our job, and we have to take it seriously, and we have to do it selflessly. These people taught me to be a better singer, but way more importantly, they taught me to be a better person. They believed in me. And the power of that is unreal. Never underestimate the power you give someone by believing in them. So find those people this weekend. Find those kids. Go out there. Give back. Sing with each and every person. And if it's you that needs that motivation, we have a society of people and a room full of people that love you and are ready to embrace you with open arms. So never underestimate the power you give yourself by believing in you. Thank you so much for this opportunity.